Dell podcast. I am pleased to have Dr. Pete on with me again today. So I don't think he needs any introduction, but I will give a slight introduction. And those of you who have not um, familiarized yourself yet with Dr. Raymond Pete, you can check him out at R-A-Y-P-E-A-T dot com. And um, we're going to be talking today about testosterone and high cortisol and you know, I, I wanted to touch on this because we're seeing a lot, or at least I am seeing a lot in my nutrition practice of clients coming in with their blood work and having too high of cortisol and too low of testosterone, even women. So I think it's a pretty important topic, and I wanted to ask the what I consider, the, in my opinion, the leading authority in health and wellness, since he's been teaching now and probably, well, I would say learning and teaching for how many years, Dr. Pete, altogether? Uh, as early as 1960, wow, uh, but I was doing it independently then. Uh, I concentrated on the hormones uh, between 1968 and 72 when I got my PhD. Wow. Yeah, I I know you've taught at many numerous schools, the University of Oregon, Urbana College, Montana State University, the Natural College of Neuro, uh, Naturopathic Medicine, and you've even taught internationally in Mexico as well. So, I mean, uh, since I consider you the leading authority based on everybody that I've looked into over the years to try to get my information from, and as a nutritionist, I find that yours is the most logical and the most backed with science. So. I really appreciate all that you've taught me so far, and I know my listeners will really benefit from this podcast, too. So I want to talk to you specifically about low testosterone and high cortisol, kind of a tag team of symptoms I'm seeing, and I want you to fill my listeners in on why this might be happening. Maybe you've seen it kind of come to fruition, too, um, and maybe there's some listening out there that have some of the symptoms that I wanted you to touch on with, with regard to it as well. So could you talk about why maybe uh, cortisol is so high in so many people right now and the, the sex hormones basically are down? Well, it isn't uh, the sex hormones as a group because estrogen uh, rises when you're under stress along with cortisol. Right. Uh, and uh, when the androgens in general decrease, that usually goes with the a decrease of progesterone, uh, and uh, that uh, creates a, a susceptibility to stress, uh, and uh, every, everything harmful practically will increase both your estrogen and cortisol, uh, and the, the uh, first barrier to harm uh, is the, the group of steroids, uh, pregnenolone, progesterone, DHEA, and testosterone. All of these have uh, broadly over overlapping protective effects that protect your energy apparatus, uh, your sensory apparatus, uh, keep things uh, stable and working. Uh, and uh, injury simply doesn't happen when uh, you have a great abundance of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can uh, run a marathon or, or uh, swim in ice water 
absorb some of the things that cortisol would produce. Uh, uh, for example, cortisol maintains your blood sugar level so that you can keep working, but it does it by converting your proteiny tissues, muscles, skin, uh, 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 thymus gland, uh, lymphatic tissues in general, uh, and uh, finally, uh, digestive system, uh, mm -hmm. liver and intestine will be uh, cannibalized to, to make sugar and energy under the influence of cortisol. Uh, the the um, protective effect of uh, testosterone was demonstrated once using radioactive uh, testosterone molecules uh, that they injected it into athletes uh, and thought that uh, they would see uh, radiation coming out of their muscles. Mm -hmm. But what they saw was uh, the most of the radiation uh, was coming from their heart. Uh, testosterone is most concentrated in the organs that are most vital to survival. So it concentrates in the heart, lungs, and brain at, at the highest uh, uh, ratio to protein, uh, even though it, it's responsible <coughs> for making <coughs> uh, an athlete's muscles uh, bigger and bigger under the influence of testosterone. What it's doing is preventing those being used up for energy. Uh, so with age, if you're producing less of the protective steroids, a given amount of cortisol might not look uh, extremely high in relation to the standards. But if you're pregnenolone, progesterone, DHEA, and testosterone are lower than average, even a moderate amount of, of cortisol begins eating up your muscles and skin, and uh, eventually it can uh, start deteriorating uh, your heart, lungs, and brain. Wow, that is... I wanted to come back to the athlete kind of um, mentality of low testosterone and high cortisol because I think that's really important to talk about too. But you had said something that um, kind of made me question, like, is it the chicken or the egg? Like, is it a high cortisol response that leads to low things like low progesterone, low testosterone? Or is it something happening that causes the low progesterone and low testosterone and leads to the stress response of high cortisol? Uh, it's usually a gradual deterioration from poor nutrition or uh, eating foods that are irritating or toxic okay. uh, or things that, uh, for example, foods that suppress your thyroid function. Uh, thyroid is necessary to produce these protective steroids. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the cholesterol is converted pretty massively in the pregnenolone and the other protective steroids if you have vitamin A and thyroid hormone adequately. But if you're deficient in either of those, the uh, cholesterol will rise in your blood. That generally means that you're not making enough uh, DHEA and testosterone, for example. Mm. Uh, so, so low thyroid, which causes uh, high cholesterol, the real meaning of that is that you're not making enough of the protective testosterone and related steroids. And when that happens, your cortisol and other stress hormones rise. Uh, so low thyroid uh, is the, the most common thing uh, responsible for a, a bad ratio of cortisol to testosterone. Well, that makes complete sense. And so then leading into like whether it's the bad foods or the thyroid being a, a result of poor nutrition, as you say, too, could it also be um, the, like the athletes we were talking about, maybe overtraining, over exercising that can also lead to this, like just too much chronic output that's stressing the body in a physical manner? Uh, yeah, someone did an experiment putting people on a treadmill and measuring their active thyroid hormone, T3, and they had them walk at, they kept their pulse rate uh, 
at 120 beats per minute or less, just very mild walking on the treadmill. And in an hour, they had become hypothyroid in the sense of uh, reducing their activation of thyroid uh, in, in the T3. But doctors are now being taught that they should ignore T3, the active hormone, and think about only uh, thyroid-stimulating hormone, TSH, mm -hmm. and only thyroxin or T4. Mm -hmm. But when you're uh, an athlete, for example, is suppressing their T3, their uh, thyroxin will actually rise in a, a reaction. Uh, and so uh, doctors are being taught things that will make them necessarily miss the effects of stress uh, on your thyroid, uh, and that leads to misinterpretation of everything downstream. Uh, for example, when your thyroid goes down from stress, your estrogen uh, normally is being excreted and kept at a low level systemically by the thyroid activating the liver metabolism. The liver uh, solubilizes estrogen, making it uh, leave through the kidneys uh, and be excreted. Uh, if your thyroid drops from stress, very quickly your estrogen will rise. And then the estrogen activates directly on the adrenals. It increases cortisol production uh, and uh, many other levels. It activates your pituitary to uh, stimulate uh, cortisol production from the adrenals and it activates your brain in many different ways through the uh, corticotropic uh, uh, re release factor, CRH, mm -hmm. uh, to activate uh, the adrenals and pituitary. Uh, so just uh, dropping the, the uh, uh, active thyroid, you very quickly uh, turn on uh, both the uh, estrogen and the whole uh, cortisol stress system. And I would assume a someone who is looking to put on muscle and maybe an athlete that's looking to train for an event, they're not going to want excess estrogen. And so what that study you were saying is like they were just walking and T3 was reduced. And so imagine these people. Are you familiar, uh, Dr. Pete, with like CrossFit? I, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, intense uh, overexertion. Uh, the, the Russians were... Uh, 50 or 60 years ago being accused of using testosterone because they had worked out the way to undertrain, mm. uh, avoid uh, overexertion, and so keep their stress hormones down and their cortisol up. It takes uh, really a very moderate amount of muscle building exercise to increase testosterone and lower cortisol. The muscle itself becomes an endocrine organ in a constructive sense. Uh, if you're under stress, your muscle will actually produce cortisol and not testosterone. When it's mm -hmm. properly stimulated, the muscle becomes a, a testosterone stimulating a producing organ. Uh, uh, it isn't just, just the uh, uh, gonads that produce testosterone if, if you're doing things right. Interesting. So pretty much this, this chronic output of like these CrossFit classes they're going to and heavy lifting or heavy duty weight training and things like that. And uh, 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 yeah, yeah. A woman doing uh, just one or two minutes of mild uh, dumbbell uh, lifts and a few uh, squats uh, for the big leg muscles mm -hmm. uh, can shift her balance from cortisol to testosterone. Yeah. Okay, and so any more and, than and that, it just we takes don't need more than a, a minute or two, uh, two, two or three times a day, at, at whatever it takes to increase the muscle mass. And it, it's really a very small, small amount of uh, uh, muscle lifting type exercise. Okay, so that's good to know. So it's like it is beneficial to lift heavy things, but we don't need to do these hour-long CrossFit classes that are pushing your body to the limit and doing it every day kind of thing to where instead of creating muscle building, you're actually inducing a cortisol response, yes? Uh, yes. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. So that's really, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this because I think there's a mentality out there that more is better. So if lifting heavy things is good, I should lift it all the time and strain my body and stress my body. But the people that I've seen that exercise the most, like my clients that have exercised the most, they're the ones that I'm seeing with um, high sex hormone binding globulin and low testosterone. So can you talk a little bit about um, sex binding, uh, sex hormone binding glob globulin, if I can say that word right? Uh, I think that is uh, the body's defense against estrogen. Okay. Uh, when it's high, a woman has a lower risk of breast cancer because mm -hmm. it, it keeps the estrogen out of cells. Mm -hmm. It actually tends to pull estrogen out of cells protectively. Okay. Uh, but when, when it's high in response, depending against estrogen, it can also interfere with testosterone effect. Um, so you mentioned a little bit of um, how cortisol and estrogen are related, but there's another kind of player in all of this, too, that we should talk about, which is adrenaline. Like, are they all intertwined together as far as adrenaline and cortisol and estrogen, too? Uh, yeah. Uh, all of the stress hormones interfere with the conversion of uh, T4 to T3. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, instead of uh, making the effective uh, respiration promoting T3, they convert thyroxin into reverse T3. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they dispose of, of the precursor uh, and uh, turn it into uh, an interfering, uh, inactive uh, suppressor of respiration. Uh, uh, and uh, those same stress hormones that produce the inactive blocking reverse T3 also uh, tend to suppress the pituitary TSH, making it look like you're even hyperthyroid, because doctors are taught to uh, uh, diagnose uh, hyperthyroidism in terms of abnormally low TSH. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the stress, which is lowering most people's TSH, uh, is uh, uh, cause causing uh, the, uh, the hypothyroidism uh, and is caused by hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so a low thyroid person uh, raises their estrogen uh, test uh, uh, cortisol uh, and adrenaline, uh, and these uh, add up to lower your TSH and make it look like you have too much thyroid, uh, according to the way doctors are uh, being indoctrinated. Hmm. And so th that would be why so many people go to the doctor and say, well, you're actually, you have too much thyroid going on, but yet the person is exhibiting all the signs of low thyroid, such as weight gain and hair loss and energy loss, but yet the doctor's seeing it on the other end, right? Uh, yeah, for 65 years it's been known how it works, but doctors uh, are increasingly mis misinformed. I don't know what the real power for, for this is, but the indoctrination has become more intense in just the last two or three years, mm -hmm. telling doctors, uh, don't look at T3, even just look at TSH, and cons don't worry, even if the TSH is as high as uh, 10, which is yeah. <laughs> dangerous, mm -hmm. it, it's horribly uh, toxic. TSH itself is a, an inflammation promoting hormone. Mm -hmm. uh, even if a person isn't hypothyroid in the sense of uh, not having enough T3, if their TSH is increased, they will get the worst heart uh, uh, disease uh, signs of hypothyroidism. So part of uh, the uh, disease uh, effects of hypothyroidism are really uh, an excess of TSH mm -hmm. uh, rather, rather than the, the direct lack of uh, metabolic stimulation from T3. Yeah, and I definitely want to do a whole podcast on thyroid with you because I think that's so fascinating with regard to um, how stress affects the thyroid and then conversely how the thyroid affects everything else. But um, as far as, as talking about um, 
weight gain. Like, I don't think people understand the importance of uh, women having testosterone, the right adequate testosterone. I think we always think of it as a male hormone, but women really need tes testosterone as well. And what I see is with low testosterone in women, they, they do have this additional weight gain, which I'm assuming is because it, it, conversely, they're also experiencing high estrogen. But can you talk about the importance of a good amount of testosterone for women and not just men? It uh, has to be balanced uh, both in men and women, mm -hmm. uh, it has to be balanced with DHEA mm -hmm. and cortisol. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, normally it is unless you're supplementing it uh, as a drug. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of these, uh, especially the, the DHEA, is a, a, an activator of fat oxidizing. Uh, and uh, your muscle is the organ that is most equipped uh, for oxidizing fat. Uh, your, your brain mm -hmm. and heart uh, don't do well uh, oxidizing fat compared to glucose, but the muscles are, are perfectly adapted for burning fat. Mm -hmm. And everything you do uh, to uh, increase your muscles' uh, uh, production of testosterone and reduction of cortisol is favoring uh, that fat burning. Mm. And so just the right amount of exercise to build muscle uh, will uh, shift your metabolism to safely consume fat in your muscles uh, while leaving adequate uh, glucose for your brain and, and lungs. Mm. And so like weight gain is probably one of the symptoms of low testosterone. Could you talk some other symptoms that people might see if cortisol is high and testosterone is low? Uh, depression, okay. uh, uh, the, the whole stress system uh, that ends up uh, increasing your cortisol and decreasing DHEA, progesterone, and testosterone, mm -hmm. that whole system is related to the inflammatory and, and degenerative processes, uh, and uh, uh, depression is how we experience that process. Uh, uh, the body uh, senses that it's being destroyed by the stress hormones and it wants to stop everything uh, mm -hmm. to uh, sort of uh, hibernate or, or go into hiding until the stress is over. So mm -hmm. uh, what you experience is, is depression, uh, uh, sometimes anxiety and aggression. Uh, aggression comes up uh, when you're being uh, overstressed and made to anxiety. It's all uh, 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 different sides of the same reaction, but uh, when your body is being damaged, you get these negative emotions, uh, aggression, anxiety, uh, and depression. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because that's what I'm seeing in the people that have those, those lower, you know, like you mentioned, testosterone, DHEA, and progesterone, and then higher cortisol, so that makes complete sense. Um, as far as, like, the, like, you'll hear a lot of people that in order to regulate their hormones, they're being taught, like, with YouTube education, I call it, and of course, I'm on YouTube, too, but I'm trying to interview people like yourself that actually have valid information and valid science behind it, but... Um, they, you hear a lot about fasting and intermittent fasting as a way of improving hormones and cortisol, and I don't buy into that, and I wanted to get your opinion. Do you see fasting as a way to improve hormones and lower, lower cortisol, or is it actually contributing to the stress response in the body? Um, uh, yeah, one, one day of um, fasting, uh, the body stores several ounces <clears throat> of glu uh, glucose in the form of uh, glycogen. Mm -hmm. And you can go, if, if you're healthy, you can go uh, up to 24 hours on your stored glycogen. Uh, and uh, uh, as, as the, the body senses stress, uh, lowering the T3 uh, slows uh, the rate of uh, fuel use. Uh, so when your uh, glycogen has uh, gone away, that means you have to start using uh, your tissue to, to make glucose out of your muscles. Uh, and uh, 
your thyroid didn't slow down when you have this prolonged stress or fasting situation. If your thyroid didn't drastically shut down your oxygen uh, requirement, uh, you would uh, eat your whole body up uh, in just a few days. Mm. Uh, but uh, since uh, the depressive process turns off the metabolism, makes you want to hibernate, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, slows the, the rate of uh, degeneration of all of your organs. Uh, the, uh, uh, if, if you uh, at least give uh, a little bit of uh, glucose and minerals, uh, just some uh, sodium chloride uh, and or uh, calcium, magnesium, and potassium uh, during the uh, fasting or low calorie period, uh, you can greatly reduce your tissue loss uh, uh, on a low calorie diet. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a person on just a water fast for 10 days, uh, they found that uh, I think it was uh, 80% or, or more of their weight loss came from destruction of their muscle and skin mass. Mm -hmm. But if they had uh, a five or 600 calorie diet with adequate minerals, almost all of the fat uh, uh, weight loss was in the, the form of fat loss rather than muscle. Uh, so a, a complete uh, fast is very destructive to the, the body. Yeah, and it's good to hear you say that because there's a lot of misinformation out there about it. So I hope people will do their own research too and look into some things about fasting before they attempt it. Because really, fasting in a in a nature sense, if we were out fasting, that would mean we didn't find food. So it would be a stress response to the body, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, some of the professors when I taught at the naturopathic school uh, were advocates of, of fasting. Uh, and uh, they talked about detoxifying by fasting, uh, but uh, that got me interested in what really happens. Uh, the liver is the organ of detoxification, and when you're depriving the liver of sugar and exposing it to cortisol, uh, not only does the estrogen rise, but it loses its ability to detoxify other things. Uh, the reason the ex estrogen rises is that the uh, uh, sulfation and glucuronidation detoxifying systems are shut down by fasting. Uh, and so it's exactly the opposite of uh, detoxifying. Uh, in Mexico, uh, I had been exposed to a, a type of insecticide uh, disinfectant that uh, they used on, on buses and motels for a while, uh, and uh, it had a particular uh, uh, odor to it that was recognizable. Uh, uh, when I, I realized I was being uh, poisoned by uh, inhaling uh, the fumes of this uh, in public places, uh, I decided to leave, uh, and uh, as I was driving home across the desert, every time I got hungry, I would smell uh, this uh, insecticide uh, uh, cleansing material in my exhaled breath. And for a, about two months after that, uh, I, I, every time I would have low blood sugar, uh, three o'clock in the morning I would wake up and smelling on my in exhaled breath uh, this pine sol uh, insecticide uh, odor. Uh, and uh, as soon as that odor stopped leaving my body when I got hungry, then I went into a hyperthyroid state. So it had been uh, suppressing my thyroid, uh, and uh, I, I was exposing myself to it uh, anew every time I would uh, lower my blood sugar by uh, mobilizing 
24 hours before slaughtering them. Mm-hmm. And uh, they sampled the various tissues that the fat at the slaughterhouse was found to be full uh, of uh, the, the whatever insecticide they had been exposed to. But the, the liver was the cleanest organ. After 24 hours, it had cleaned itself up uh, and uh, had the, the lowest con- uh, concentration of, of all of the poisons. Uh, uh, the meat uh, had the, the next highest concentration and the blood uh, 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 lower because it was uh, constantly being de- detoxified by the liver. Uh, so a uh, fast is, is uh, a way to maybe clean up your liver, but uh, definitely uh, is not good for your brain and uh, immune system. Yes, and the liver, as far as I'm understanding, is also important for things like testosterone too, so you really want good liver uh, um, production and detoxification just for the production of testosterone, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, in the case of progesterone, which in a woman is produced uh, even even in greater quantities than a man produces uh, testosterone. Uh-huh. Uh, during the premenstrual time, uh, the daily progesterone production is maybe 30 milligrams a day. Uh-huh. Uh, but the, the liver adapts to that very large production. And uh, after two weeks of that high production, uh, the enzymes increase and start excreting uh, progesterone uh, as well as uh, estrogen and testosterone. Uh, So uh, at menstruation, the synthesis of new progesterone stops, and for two weeks, the liver has very low exposure to progesterone, uh, meaning that uh, it will have a chance to uh, reset its detoxifying enzymes to zero, Mm -hmm. so that uh, at uh, ovulation, it's all ready to let your body experience the full force of the progesterone. Uh, If a a man is supplementing testosterone every day, if he exceeds the liver's normal uh, uh, preference for a a level of testosterone, the same thing happens. If he takes 30 milligrams by injection, for example, the liver experiences the same thing a woman's uh, liver experiences with high levels of progesterone, uh, and the man uh, throws off the testosterone very quickly. So after a week or two of being exposed to high testosterone, he is now excreting it very fast uh, and uh, probably is is, uh, uh, getting about as much estrogen effect as testosterone effect. Uh, and uh, the medical uh, use of, of testosterone, uh, they sometimes give 50 or 100 milligrams at once. Uh, so their liver experiences this gigantic overdose where it should be four or five milligrams uh, per day in a young man. Uh, the liver uh, goes into a, a testosterone destroying uh, condition. So with regard to things like, since we're talking um, different diseases and stuff too, and with regard to the liver, I wanted to get your thoughts on um, cancer and how high cortisol can play into that. My mom actually died of stomach cancer at 45, and she lived a very, very stressful existence, both physically, she was like an over-exerciser, she was an emotionally, she was emotionally stressed, mentally stressed from work, and hardly slept. And and she also starved herself quite frequently to achieve a body shape that she was looking for. And I'm convinced the stress is what killed her. But how, in your opinion, does chronically elevated cortisol and it's related to, like, how is it related to things such as cancer? Uh, uh, The um, below, behind uh, the the rise of estrogen and cortisol and the fall of of thyroid uh, is, is the tissue level of stress and in the alimentary canal histamine and serotonin are massively produced 
5% uh, of our uh, serotonin in the body uh, comes from the intestine. Uh, and uh, stomach ulcers can be produced uh, just by an excess of serotonin. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the intestine is uh, involved in all stress, but especially in prolonged, uh, ultimately carcinogenic stresses. And uh, uh, as the histamine and serotonin increase in the digestive system, that allows uh, uh, endotoxin and, and nitric oxide to rise. Uh, all, uh, all of those interfere with our ability to pr produce respiratory uh, energy uh, shift over to the lactic acid production. And lactic acid activates uh, the stress hormones uh, mm -hmm. and uh, promotes inflammation. Uh, and lactic acid is carcinogenic in itself. It, it uh, not only is produced by cancer, but it uh, promotes all of the features of cancer, inflammation, uh, accelerated cell division, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, serotonin is one of the most powerful activators of the cortis cortisol stress hormone system. Mm -hmm. And uh, it acts uh, powerfully on the part of the hypothalamus that makes the CRH, corticotropin release hormone. Mm -hmm. And that is produced not only in the brain, but in all of the peripheral tissues. And it's a promoter of tissue inflammation and shift of metabolism. Uh, stomach cancer and, and uh, intestinal cancer are, are, are very uh, deeply involved with excess serotonin, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a really a base activator of the whole stress system. Uh, it, it works directly on the pituitary as well as on the brain and other tissues. Uh, and uh, incidentally, uh, other tissues uh, besides the adrenals uh, are uh, potential cortisol uh, producers. Even our skin can make cortisol when it's under stress. Mm -hmm. So she had some pretty intense habits that led to a stress response, such as, you know, sleeping maybe two or three hours a night, burning the candles at both ends. She was an overthinker, overanalyzer, overexerciser. Um, are there, like, certain habits, not just foods, but certain things people are doing, like just overachievers in life, people doing too much that are also creating this stress response in the body that's, that can contribute to that loss of all those important hormones? Um, yeah, regular sleep is a powerfully protective thing. Uh, it, it, it should be somewhere in the range of uh, six to nine hours every night, but the regularity it, is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes uh, a, a built-in, uh, uh, almost a machine-like uh, reg once once you get a schedule set uh, and uh, any variation of, of that. Uh, schedule uh, puts the whole 24-hour uh, cycle uh, into a, a stress pattern. Mm. Uh, so, so it isn't just uh, the number of hours, but the, the regularity with which you get those hours of sleep that is anti-stress. Uh, and uh, uh, high progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA are, are uh, promoters of restorative sleep. Mm. Uh, cortisol uh, Really, really interferes at all levels of, of uh, uh, sleep restoration 
associated cortisol does the same thing, where uh, uh, androgens, DHEA, and, and testosterone and progesterone uh, protect the athlete, uh, the, the brain, heart, and lungs are protected by those, but uh, prolonged exposure to high estrogen, even in pregnancy or, or in anorexia, uh, will shrink uh, the, the uh, frontal lobes of the brain that handle long-range perspective. But I liked what you said about it can be rebuilt. I think people aren't aware that um, if even if you've had a really strong cortisol response for a long time, you've been a, in a stress response for a long time, that if we can do things to mitigate that, we can actually get our body back into a calm state. There is a way to do that. It's not, And it doesn't have to do with taking ashwagandha and all these things. There is a really safe way to do it. And so can you talk about that? Can you talk about like how yeah, we can rebuild? It's very much like exercise, uh, but you have to uh, stop the stress first before you can exercise effectively. Right. Uh, they, they know that uh, a given activity, for example, taxi drivers have a, a bigger uh, part of the brain that handles uh, memory. Uh, if they, they know every street in a big city, and, and that requires a bigger part of that brain. Uh, one of my first students at the naturopathic college was a taxi driver mm. who uh, decided to study medicine and uh, she was just spectacularly able to put things together unlike the students who had just gone to college. Mm -hmm. uh, she had this global uh, ability to perceive how things interact mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that kind of Exercise uh, works best if you maintain uh, the protective hormones, even supplementing pregnenolone, mm -hmm. uh, progesterone, DHEA, mm -hmm. and, and testosterone, mm -hmm. uh, combined with uh, the kind of mental activity that you want to develop. Uh, that will, uh, in, a, in a relatively short time, uh, re rebuild uh, and it changes uh, your attitude. Uh, learned helplessness, for example, uh, from prolonged stress uh, can be overcome. Yeah, that, that I've heard you talk about learned helplessness. Can you expand on that a little bit for my listeners? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that can be uh, repaired with any of these protective hormones or with behavioral uh, insight. Yeah. But um, uh, the the, uh, the stress the stress process that, that uh, causes you to uh, become helpless or uh, obsessive or uh, over analytic or, or whatever uh, stopping the stress is the first thing, and that requires good nutrition and. Uh, Good nutrition uh, should include plenty of carbohydrate uh, so that you don't have to uh, re rely on the cortisone uh, or cortisol to, to convert uh, protein amino acids into uh, glucose. Uh, and uh, usually uh, s something more than 100 grams per day uh, of carbohydrate preferably in the form uh, of sucrose, but uh, it can be, uh, if you're very active physically, uh, two or three hundred grams a day of, of uh, carbohydrate, especially sugar, uh, can be restorative to the brain. I'm so glad you brought this up because one of my next things was to talk to about the dangers of sugarless diet. So, like, I think people are, are all about, uh, talk about the dangers of how dangerous sugar is, but you actually talk about the dangers of a sugarless diet and how, you know, our body runs on glucose and therefore if you don't take it in, your body will simply make it from its own bodily tissues, such as breaking down muscle like you were talking about before. So I think we don't know the dangers of going sugarless, actually. We know too much about eating sugar, but not enough about how much we actually do need to eat it. Uh, you know, all of the things that trigger the stress hormones involve interference with glucose metabolism. Uh, hypoglycemia itself 
that is a powerful uh, activator of, of the stress system. Uh, excess of free fatty acids, which will block the ability to use glucose, mm -hmm. uh, will activate the, the stress hormones. Uh, lactic acid, which uh, results when you're not using your glucose properly, it's a sign that there's a, a, a in effect, a deficiency of glucose. Uh, that activates cortisol production. Uh, all of these uh, stress signs, uh, inflammation, uh, overexertion, uh, these require more glucose to suppress inflammation to get energy production going. Uh, and uh, uh, so the obvious way to uh, stop the stress reaction is to provide enough glucose and oxygen uh, along with the other nutrients. If you pro provide uh, only protein and fat as your uh, bulk uh, nutrients, uh, you're going to increase your cortisol uh, just to uh, convert the protein to the amount of glucose that your uh, brain and blood cells need. Uh, and that cortisol, even though it's uh, being fed with protein, is going to have all of these uh, indirect actions that are harmful in, in the long run. It's going to uh, change the way your immune system works, for example. Yeah, and like so, as far as like the glucose in your diet, we know we know from listening to you that's important. So that's why, like on the last podcast, we talked about how ketogenic and low carb diets are actually you know causing some of the stress response as opposed to helping with cortisol. So are there certain foods? I mean, I I know you've mentioned sugar in different forms like fructose and sucrose, but are there different foods that can actually help lower cortisol and increase things like progesterone and testosterone? Um, yeah, the reason I talk so much about milk and orange juice is that they are the most available foods that have the most components uh, that tend to shut down excess cortisol production, uh, lower uh, adrenaline, uh, reduce serotonin, nitric oxide, uh, all, all of the harmful mediators of inflammation and stress. Uh, everyone can... Uh, uh, with, with some luck, can find good milk uh, and sweet orange juice, uh, and uh, those each of them has hundreds of, of beneficial factors. Uh, the calcium itself uh, in milk uh, and the minerals, uh, potassium and the other minerals in orange juice, uh, lower uh, the stress factors in uh, multiple ways. Uh, uh, most people are having uh, a borderline uh, calcium and vitamin D deficiency in, in most of the world. Uh, and uh, when you're border, borderline in vitamin D and, and calcium, you increase your parathyroid hormone. Uh, if you're borderline in your mineral, especially sodium intake, uh, your aldosterone and angiotensin uh, increase. Uh, these uh, parathyroid hormone and aldosterone interact very closely and turn off your energy production, uh, shift you over to uh, wasting sugar, uh, increasing your cortisol, uh, destroying your, your protein tissues. Uh, so getting your aldosterone and parathyroid hormone uh, as low as you can uh, 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 will uh, at the same time increase your metabolic efficiency and so reduce your exposure to the stress hormones. That's great information. So I'm also assuming that foods that help with thyroid production would also lower a stress response in the body and therefore help with hormone production too? Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, 
so what foods, as, as far as like your favorite foods, are pro-thyroid that would help lower that stress response? Um, av avoiding the polyunsaturated fats uh, is a, a universal benefit. Uh, uh, as, as far as possible, uh, n not to add, for example, fish oil or algae oil to your diet, uh, not to use uh, uh, safflower, uh, uh, canola uh, oil, uh, uh, none of the liquid oils. Those are all anti-thyroid, anti-progesterone, uh, anti-DHEA, and so on. And in effect, uh, they increase your stress hormones. They're the precursors for uh, the prostaglandin-like materials, uh, which uh, amplify all of the inflammatory and stress reactions. Uh, so just cutting out the polyunsaturated fats uh, shifts you, increases your thyroid function, uh, and uh, lowers the, the stress hormones. So therefore that leaves us with saturated fats, which I would assume are pretty good at helping to lower cortisol as well. Do they help um, increase progesterone and testosterone? I guess the main goal is to lower the cortisol so that your, those particular hormones will rise, correct? Um, yeah, when you are not eating the, the uh, proof of polyunsaturated fats, uh, if you eat extra calories, you produce the saturated fats. Uh, and so your tissues will gradually, uh, over a period of several years, uh, gradually uh, become more saturated. And uh, there, if you look at the ratio of saturated fat to polyunsaturated in your tissues, uh, the saturation index corresponds to lifespan. Uh, animals with the highest saturation index, uh, the lowest polyunsaturated fat in their tissues have the longest life expectancy. Uh, and uh, a lot of that is uh, related to thyroid uh, and these protective uh, steroids. Wow. I, so I'm assuming that you're pretty saturated then for being <laughs> um, 82 and you are just the epitome of health. And so I, I assume based on your diet, you're pretty saturated then, huh? I, I <laughs> hope so. I, 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 I don't uh, eat a completely ideal diet. Uh, it takes a, a lab to prepare food uh, to get rid of all of the toxic fats. Uh, in the 1930s, a man did it, uh, the, the lab intended to uh, demonstrate that taking out all of the fat would cause a deficiency of the essential fatty acids. But this guy uh, had had lifelong headaches and blood pressure problems. Uh, after, I think it was uh, three or four months uh, on this fat-free diet, he stopped having his headaches and his blood pressure normalized and as long as uh, there was any information about him uh, after that diet he never had a recurrence of his health problems so far from producing deficiency diseases uh, this extreme uh, laboratory uh, uh, defined uh, fat free diet uh, cured his lifelong health problems. Wow, that's incredible. So there is some validity to watching your fat intake and making sure that you have good glucose intake. And so where does protein fit into all this? What are your favorite sources of protein for lowering cortisol and increasing those hormones we've been talking about, like progesterone and testosterone and DHEA? Um, a gelatin happens to be fairly close to an ideal protein for an adult. Uh, milk protein uh, it, it has a, a fair amount uh, of tryptophan, cysteine, uh, and uh, 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 th th these are pro-inflammatory amino acids that are used in growth. Milk uh, it is ideal for growing and has anti-inflammatory, anti-stress factors. But uh, for an adult, I, I think it should be supplemented uh, 
with, with something like uh, uh, gelatin as an extra protein which lacks uh, the uh, pro-inflammatory uh, uh, growth related amino acids. So that's interesting. So you could almost do like a blend your morning coffee with a little collagen gelatin and some milk and make almost like a little protein smoothie that way with a little coffee, huh? I, yeah, I, I use about uh, eight or nine ounces of milk with uh, an ounce or two of extremely concentrated coffee uh, for my uh, breakfast meal. You sound like an espresso lover. That sounds like a concentrated coffee that's an espresso, and that's what I love, too. Uh, yeah, you, <laughs> you don't get an excess of water that way. Yes, that's true. Well, Dr. Pete, I could go on and on and on, but I know that you are getting ready to work on your next newsletter, and so I want to touch on that a little bit. I want to let people know that they can actually sign up for your newsletter, which is amazing, um, and they can sign up via to receive it through the mail or also through email. And it's uh, twenty-eight dollars, I believe, for um, email the newsletter, and then it's thirty. Is it thirty-eight dollars to get it through the mail? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that's for twelve issues by monthly so yes. it's for two years of issues yeah and they can do that by emailing ray Pete's newsletter at gmail.com and i'll have all that information in this sh in the show notes as well and i also want to encourage you guys to go check out all of his articles at raypeat.com because that's where you're really going to get just a cornucopia of information that will just blow your socks off so uh, Dr. Pete, I just so appreciate your time. I love, love, love talking with you. And um, sorry we had a little connection issues today, but I really will take any part of you that I can get. So I appreciate your time today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, you guys stay tuned for more. Hopefully next time we can talk about um, the thyroid a little bit more, Dr. Pete, if that's okay with you. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye for now.